As scientists, we often talk about the endpoints of our research, our discoveries, and our results. I'd like to talk about the process of science, because biology means the study of life. So I'd like us all to think about how we study that life. Now, my own journey started my first year of graduate school at Cornell University. I was part of the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior, and I'd chosen to study the neurobiology and behavior of a group of flies. So at the end of my first semester, I sat down with one of my advisors, Tom Eisner, who you see right here, and I asked him if he could give me any advice on how to go about doing my research. So he looked at me in the eye, leaned back in his chair, put his arms behind his head, and said, think like a fly. Now, he actually didn't tell me anything else, and he didn't give me any explanation for what he meant by this statement, so I left his office completely confused by what he meant. You see, Tom was a naturalist, and when you hear that word naturalist, it sounds very romantic and adventurous. Maybe you think of Mr. Novak here trudging through the jungles, looking for strange and exotic creatures, and smelling beautiful flowers along the way. But actually, being a naturalist is a particular way of thinking about biology, which influences how we then do that biology. Jennifer Frazier notes that naturalists are interested in what higher order theories and processes can tell them about their organism. And that means that naturalists are interested in organisms for their own sake. And the theories and processes are only to give them more information about that particular organism. 100 years ago, most biologists were naturalists. Laboratory techniques didn't really allow for much understanding of the cellular and molecular level understanding of life, so most biologists studied organisms at the organismal level. So they did things like field work, as you see here on the left in Sikkim, or they looked at very early micrographs of tissues of organisms, like these mandibles of a dragonfly. But the 20th century saw unprecedented increase in our understanding of the cellular and molecular processes that undergo life. Suddenly, biologists could do things they had only dreamed about. They were able to study life at the level of a single molecule, like this most famous first image of DNA. So very quickly, studying biology at mechanistic levels in the laboratory became the way to understand biology. And the world moved indoors. And that's where my story starts, at the end of the 20th century, in the midst of this explosion of knowledge. Now, as I mentioned, I had chosen to study a group of flies, as you see here. And these particular flies were all specialized on different fruits. We had apple flies and blueberry flies and cherry flies, etc. And because I was at the end of the 20th century, I had all these amazing techniques at my fingertips. I could study the chemical makeup of the odors of individual fruits. I could then present those odors to single neurons in the fly's nervous system and record their activity. And I could, of course, do behavioral essays as well, like this flight tunnel, where I could then present the odors of the fruit to the fly and watch how they flew to it. So that's what I did. In particular, I was interested in studying a group of flies that were specific to snowberries which are tiny little white berries that are common to North America. So I identified their chemicals, and I looked at their neurons, and then I put those odors in the flight tunnel from their fruit, and I put the flies in there, and they sat there. So I went back, and I looked at my chemicals, and I made sure they were correct, and I redid the neuroanalysis, and then I put the chemicals back in the flight tunnel, and they still sat there. I actually put actual snowberries in the flight tunnel, and they still sat there, and they sat there for an entire year of my dissertation. Out of desperation, I said to my advisors, please, can I just go out and watch these flies and watch them around snowberries? Maybe I'll get some idea of what I am doing wrong. And they said, fine. So I did. Do you know what I found? They don't fly to their fruit in nature. When I watch them, they're going to these low bush snowberries, and most of the time they're jumping or walking towards their fruit. And they don't fly, even though they're flies, they fly a lot, not to their fruit. And I had been testing them for a year in a flight tunnel. 
So it was then that I first started to understand what Tom had told me those years before, because I had spent all my time trying to understand how flies think, and I had never stopped to try and understand what they actually think about in nature, which of course is where they evolved, not in my flight tunnel. And that got me thinking, I mean, what do insects actually think about in nature? Most insects are solitary, which means when they emerge from their eggs or their pupae, there's no mommies and daddies around to teach them what things are in their environment. And also, many insects only live for a few days or weeks at a time, so they simply don't have the time to experience everything themselves. What that means is they have to be born with the ability to detect certain objects that are very important to them. For my snowberry flies, it's snowberries. For this hoverfly, which pollinates flowers, it's flowers. And that's what our group does. Our group tries to understand how organisms, like insects in particular, are able to detect objects in their environment without any mommies or daddies there to teach them. So we go out into the natural environment first and study those organisms in nature as they are responding to those objects. And we study the objects in nature to get an idea of how the organisms detect them. To give you an example, let's take this cup of coffee. Now, my first memory of coffee is actually its smell. Because every morning, I woke up to the smell of fresh brewed pot of coffee that my parents made every single morning. And I loved that smell. And you know who else loves coffee? These guys. This is the coffee white stem borer. This is a huge, huge pest in India right now because the females lay eggs in the stem of the coffee plant and the larvae eat through that stem and it eventually kills the plant. So it's a huge, huge problem for coffee planters throughout our country. And the coffee board has asked us to try and study the biology of these beetles and see if we can figure out how to control them more effectively. So the first thing we asked them was, well, why do they like coffee? And we asked this to many different people, and everybody just looks at us blankly and says, they're coffee bores. <laughs> so that became our first question is, why they like coffee? So we set up a laboratory in the field itself, in Korg. This is what it looks like. Santosh and Raksha have set this up, and they're actually still in Korg right now doing these analyses. And the first thing they did was simply watch what the beetles do around the coffee plants. Do they fly or do they walk? And do they go, where do they go? How do they go? And they noticed they were landing mostly on the leaves. And so their first question was, well, do they land on the leaves because they're attracted to the leaves or is it simply because it's the first thing they would get to? So they did a very simple thing. They gave them the choice between a plant with leaves and a plant that they'd painstakingly take every single leaf off of. And they watched them. And nearly all of the beetles went to the plant with the leaves. So that suggests that the leaves are important for them to be able to detect their object in nature. Then did a whole series of different experiments, such as this one, where they covered plants with clear plastic. So the insects could still see the plants, but they couldn't smell them. And then they poked holes in one of those plastics so that the smells could seep through. And nearly 80% of the beetles they tested went to the plant with the plastic with holes, which suggests to us that just like me, they love the smell of coffee. So at this point in time, we're taking them back into the laboratory, and we are, in fact, using all those amazing technological and methodological tools we have at our disposal to try to understand how they understand objects. But we're using natural odors and natural cues from their environment. And we can do things like study the different processing centers of the insect brain and see how they detect those odors. Now, you may be wondering, why does any of this matter? I mean, it's interesting, but why do we care why insects detect objects? Well, I can tell you that Zayar Khan sure cares. He has developed a technology in Africa known as push-pull technology. And he has been particularly interested in a moth that is a huge pest on corn. So he has identified what they like about corn, which is some odors, and he has then found what they don't like. And he has found a plant called Desdemonium, which they really hate the smell of. And then he's found another plant called Napier grass, which they love the smell of because it's very close to the smell of corn. 
And what he does is he intercrops the desdemonium with the corn. And then in these small plots of corn, he surrounds it with napier grass. So the moths come along, and they're completely repelled by the smell of this desdemonium and the corn, and then they are pulled into the napier grass. So it's a completely ecological solution for pest management, purely based on an understanding of the natural behavior of these organisms in the field. And I can't tell you how effective it is, but I can tell you that over 110,000 farmers in East Africa have now adopted this technique. So you can see the power of understanding nature. And it's not always easy. Sometimes other organisms have different ideas for our study species or for our equipment. And this past Tuesday in, Korn, in Korg, we had really big problems. But certainly, studying nature in the environment is always fascinating. And of course, nature is always glorious. So we're struggling every day to try to become modern naturalists. Every day, we're trying to break down the wall that separates the lab from the environment and start thinking about nature as simply an extension of that space. So I hope that all of you, whether you study cancer or you're a farmer, or you just sit behind a desk, that you think about nature and see it through binoculars as much as through a microscope. And I hope that we all learn to think like a fly. Thank you. <laughs>